Colts beat the Dolphins 27-24 and go 1-0 for the fifth straight game. Five straight now for the Colts, who started off 1-5 and, and are currently sitting at 6-5. and five. Tied for the sixth seed in the playoffs, the second wild card spot with the Baltimore Ravens. And the Colts did not play good in this game in any way, shape, or form through the first three quarters. It was actually one of the worst games the Colts played through the first three quarters this season. Offense, defense, and special teams, all three phases of the game made crucial mistakes. Defensively, you had the bomb to Laurente Carew before the half. Offensively, turned the ball over three times. On special teams, we missed a field goal, and we had a punt block. So this team, in all three phases, made crucial errors in the first three quarters, leading to our 10-point fourth quarter deficit. We trailed 24-14 in the fourth quarter, but when it mattered most in the final eight minutes of this game, we stepped up in all three phases. A game where we turned the ball over three times. In a game where we had a punt blocked. In a game where we missed a field goal. In a game where we had seven penalties. We stepped up late and we made plays, impact plays, in all three phases of the game. The defense, Hunt and Leonard, they came up huge on a couple of big run-stuffing stops towards the end of the game. They got two big punts when we needed it most late in the game. We had three huge drives by the offense going field goal, touchdown, field goal, the final three drives of the game. And on special teams, they had a rough day, missed field goal, blocked, punt. But when it mattered most, Venetari hit from 46. When it mattered most, Venetari hit the game winner and possibly the play of the game. Rigoberto Sanchez on the kickoff, placing the ball beautifully inside the three-yard line, leading to some terrible field positioning for the Miami Dolphins. On top of it, there was a penalty. We pinned him back. We got the three and out, got the ball back into Luck's hands. Luck made a big-time play to Rodgers on a third and nine. We had two third-down plays that went for over 30 yards, one to T.Y., one to Rodgers in the fourth quarter. Didn't play well, but... Good teams find ways to win games where they don't play well. And this weekend, we saw a Colt team that was able to get it together late, offensively, defensively, and on special teams, all three phases. They were able to come together and make plays when it mattered most. Didn't play well in the first half. Definitely didn't play well in the third quarter. But when the game was on the line, those final eight minutes, offense, defense, and special teams, they stepped up and they made plays in all three phases of the game. And that is what good teams do. They don't play good every game. They don't play good every drive, every quarter, every half. But when the game's on the line, they step up and they make plays. And good teams win games where they don't necessarily play like a good team for 60 minutes. Yeah, I was really disappointed in the first three quarters of that game. The Colts played probably their worst. I thought that was one of their worst performances. I mean, you throw the turnovers – in there three turnovers a block punt they dropped passes in the first half they didn't really drop as many in the second half they just did not look like a good team the first three quarters but what good teams do even when they're playing that bad is they get it together they figure out what they're doing wrong they stop making mistakes and they turn it on and they get it done and that and look our fan a lot of our fans were you know losing their minds and really frustrated and I get it it was they did not play well it was definitely out of the five games one of our worst if not the worst performances not only of the five wins but of the season I thought we were really I was very upset with the way we played the first three quarters but the difference is when the game was on the line our guys stepped up and made plays not only luck who I want to give a ton of credit to T.Y. Hilton was big. I thought the running game was big, ripping off those runs. Hines, and uh, you know, get, I think he had two really big runs for first downs. Then you go over the defense, Leonard and Hooker had a big stop. You know, Rigoberto Sanchez pinning them deep on the kickoff when we got the 15 yards on the personal foul on the touchdown to Ebron, I think it was. Look, they made the plays and they had to make them. That's what good teams do. I mean, you look at teams like New England, they struggle with the Jets but they found a way to win. The Colts did the same thing with a solid Miami team. And let's give Miami credit. I thought Miami played a really good game aside from the last five minutes. I thought their play calling was bad. But give Tannehill credit. Give Gore credit. Give Xavier Howard, who made that two interceptions. That second second pick was a really great job by him, great film study. Sometimes you got to give credit to the other team. I mean, These guys are professionals, too, and that's a cliche, but it's also a fact. These guys are professionals, too. They get paid to play. Their season was on the line, just like ours was. So they're going to come out and give it everything they have. Give them credit. They played well. Tannehill was a lot better than I thought he'd be. I thought their 
Their defense was a little better than I thought it would be, and so you give them credit. But at the end of the day, we were the better team. We found a way to win, and at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Yeah, that's all that matters. But when Colt fans are just constantly criticizing our team because the other team makes plays, sometimes you have to step back and say, all right, that was a good play. All right, they did their job. Coming into this game, like you just said, two 5-5 five and five teams. Not only was our season on the line, their season was on the line. So they're playing for something, too. And they came in here and they outplayed us for a majority of this game. But in the crucial moments late, late in the fourth quarter, offensively, defensively, and on special teams, we rose to the occasion and we won all three phases when it mattered and it resulted in a win. And that's really what we focused on because you're not going to play every game perfectly. Like you said, the Patriots struggle with the Jets. The Jets are not a good football team. But when it mattered most, the Patriots made plays. They won the game. Nobody's even questioning why was it close at the half because it's the Patriots. Since we're an up-and-coming team that nobody thought was going to win three, four, five games this year, people question, ah, why was it close against Miami? Why didn't they play well in the first half? Why were they trailing by 10? Think back to the Peyton Manning days when we were loaded with talent, loaded with Hall of Famers, we're an automatic 11-win team every year. We had a lot of games where we struggled against a team we shouldn't have struggled against, but Peyton Manning and the offense woke up late. Freeney and Mathis woke up late. They got to the quarterback, and we found ways to win games even when the team didn't play well. You're not going to play well every week, but good teams find ways to win. That's what separates you at the end of the year. A team that goes 8-8 eight and, eight and a team that goes 11-5, and five, it's only a difference of three games. Three fourth quarters where we didn't play well, but we stepped up and we made plays when we needed to make plays, and that's what the Colts did. Luck, besides the two interceptions, I thought had, if you just take away those two picks, I thought he had one of his best games of the year. 30 for 37, 343 yards, three touchdowns, and obviously the two picks we touched on multiple times. The second one to Ebron, like you said, that was just a great play. They baited him, and Luck, it looked underthrown, but Ebron was open, and he kind of just got tricked, I think. I didn't like the throw to T.Y. I didn't think that throw should have been made at all, but he stepped up late too, and he was Nearly perfect. I think he finished the game in the fourth quarter. I think he finished 12 for his last 13 passes. He stepped up in the pocket when he was stumbling there late. Hit Chester Rogers on the third and nine. We had two third downs in the fourth quarter that both went for over 30 yards, which was obviously two of the biggest plays of the game. One to T.Y., one to Chester Rogers. And something I wanted to point out on that play to Chester Rogers, everybody talked about luck keeping his balance, luck keeping his eyes upfield, luck making the throw, Chester Rogers making the catch. But something that went unnoticed, Quentin Nelson held that block when a lot of guys would have given up, turned around, saw what was happening behind him. Quentin Nelson held that block. If Quentin Nelson doesn't hold that block, and most rookies probably would not hold that block, Andrew Luck gets sacked. Because when he comes out of the pile, there's going to be a defender right there ready to eat him up. And that throw is never made. That was a third down. We end up punting. We lose the momentum. Our defense just made a big stop. We would go three and out. Obviously, after the Chester Rogers catch, we milk the clock down to three seconds. Venetari goes out there, kicks the game-winning field goal. We don't let them get the ball back. And another thing, clock management. Frank Reich's clock management in the fourth quarter was superb. And that's something we have not been able to say for quite a while in Indianapolis. There's so many things to say about this game. But the first thing I want to say is, if you look at this team and the maturation of it, in the first five weeks when we struggled, we couldn't put a complete game together and we had trouble late in games, finishing games. I think that's the biggest maturity in this team is late in games. If you look at the Cincinnati game, the Philly game, the way this team kind of made all the wrong plays or they just didn't make plays, period, in those, in those games late or you know turnovers, look at a Doyle fumble in the first game the Eagles game where we're inside the five and we can't get it in the end zone. We just didn't make plays. Now you're looking at a team now, we're down 10 in the fourth quarter. We know our season's on the line. Everybody knows how big this game is. And instead of kind of folding and not making plays like we did earlier in the season, this team stepped up, focused, and made all the plays down the stretch of this game. I thought Reich was exceptional in the fourth quarter. I thought the defense was really, really good. They did a great job slowing Miami down and pinned back on that final drive. And then Rigoberto Sanchez, man, I don't think this guy gets enough credit. I know he's just a punter, but he's done a really, really good job since he's taken over for McAfee. He pinned them deep on that play. The special teams got down there, made a great tackle. That's how you finish. And that was what this team was lacking early in the year and the reason why we got off to such a slow start. We were young. We didn't know how to win games. We didn't know how to finish games. And we just came up a little short in those first few weeks against the Bengals and the Eagles and also the Texans, obviously. But 
Now you're seeing a team, when it gets tough and times get tough, they get a laser focus and they get the job done. And that's the, that shows the mark of a team that's growing and maturing. And I thought Andrew Luck was great in that game. I thought other than the one pass to T.Y., I did not have a problem with the other pass. I thought that was a great play by Howard. And sometimes you just got to tip your hat to the other team. It might not have been the, the smartest decisions based on the time and the half and where we were on the field. But then again, if you see a guy wide open down the field, you're gonna, he's going to make that throw. You want him to make that throw. It's just a great play by Howard. So, you know, it was a really, really good win in the sense that they did not play anywhere near. I mean, this is no, nowhere near as good as they can play. And they found a way to play well for the, what, final eight minutes of that game and get a win. And so they can build on this. Now they got to go into Jacksonville this week and take care of business against a team that's really, really hurting. They, they bench Blake Bortles, which I find kind of funny considering he kills the Colts for Cody Kessler, kid out of USC, who's really not played all that much since he came out or was drafted. I think he was drafted by the Browns. Not sure about that. I know his 0-6 uh, record is all with the Browns from 2016. Yeah, so I don't really understand this necessarily because of the fact that Blake Bortles always plays like friggin' Tom Brady against us, but I'm not, I'm not mad at it. Let them play Cody Kessler. Uh, they fired their offensive coordinator, so they're going to have a new play caller. And Leonard Fournette is now out because he's an idiot and got in a fight with a guy and punched him in the helmet, which I never understood <laughs> why football players fight because you're just going to hurt your hand on another guy's helmet. It doesn't make any sense to me. But, hey, that's on him. It's not my problem and it's not our problem. We just need to go out there and take care of business. But as far as this Miami game goes, it's about the bottom line. And the bottom line is we won the game, and that's all that matters. We move on. we got to get ready and win this Jacksonville game. Yep. And like we were saying, I mean, we really did call this early in the season. I'm not going to say we said we were going to win five straight and counting after that Jet game, but we talked about it all summer. It's a young team. They're probably going to get off to a slow start. We saw them beating Cincinnati. It didn't happen, but we said they're probably going to be a lot better in the second half of the season than they are in the first half of the season. We said that before the season started, and that's what we've watched. We've watched a young team mature, get better, find ways to win late. We knew Luck could do it. We knew T.Y. could do it. But outside of those guys, I mean, this team is so incredibly young. You can make an argument right now, outside of Andrew Luck and outside of T.Y. Hill and the two best players on this team, are rookies. You could easily make the argument that the two best players outside of Luck and T.Y., and maybe even just outside of Luck, are Quinn Nelson and Darius Leonard. The best player on our defense is a rookie. I don't think you can really argue against it right now. The most valuable piece to our defense, the guy who really kind of oh, gives yeah. the defense the heartbeat, is a rookie. Yeah, and, and the thing is, Luke, the crazy thing about Leonard is, you saw when he, and when he went down with that injury, my heart dropped because I yeah. knew... He is the heart and soul of our defense, man. He went out, and they went right down the field like it was nothing and scored. So you see how important he is. We cannot – like, if there's one guy we cannot afford to lose, it's him. We saw how bad we looked earlier in the season when he was hurt. We've got to keep him on the field because when he's not in there, we are an awful, awful defense. So, to me, Darius Leonard's second-best player on this team. Yeah, I would agree with that. Outside of luck, Darius Leonard's value to the team because it's a different defense without him. We could survive without T.Y. offensively. Not a knock on T.Y. It's just there's other guys that can make plays. Luck can make other guys look good. But defensively, think, we're just think, a different yeah, defense Reich, without Leonard. Yeah, I think I think Reich would scheme that too, like where we wouldn't miss T.Y. as much as... Yeah, and we saw it at times this year. T.Y. has gone down at times this year, and it's not like the offense was clicking on all cylinders without him, but they were doing enough. Defensively, you don't have Leonard out there. It's just the the 2017 defense, essentially. Yeah. You know, maybe a little bit bit different, but essentially it's the defense we've had the last couple years. Leonard is the heartbeat of the defense, and he's a rookie. Offensive line, you look at the offensive line, the best offensive lineman, well... Kelly's been so good, too, until he went down. But Quentin Nelson right brings now. the yeah, heartbeat right to the offensive line, I think. In terms of leadership, he's jumped right. Uh, like Costanzo's come back, and we haven't, you know, we've haven't. we been incredible since Costanzo's come back, and he plays a more important position being a left tackle. And Kelly's been nearly perfect, minus two bad snaps on the season, one extremely costly. Quentin Nelson's been incredible. And he in terms of value to me, brings so much to the table because he's the missing piece, right? Costanzo was here before. Kelly was here before. The offensive line never looked like this. And who wasn't here? 
it's Quinn Nelson. Quinn Nelson brings the mean streak. He brings the brotherhood. If you watch the Baldy breakdowns, one of the things that Baldy always points out is that Quinn Nelson is the first guy down the field helping up teammates. And there was a screen pass. It wasn't in this week's Baldy breakdowns, but there was a screen pass to T.Y. T.Y. went about 30-something yards with it. The first guy down the field, he was actually ahead of T.Y. as a lead blocker was Quinn Nelson. I was like, this guy's 315 pounds. How did he get down the field so fast? Was he 20 yards off sides before the snap? I mean, it's crazy. This guy's the heartbeat of the offensive line. You want to tell me Costanzo is more important because he's a left tackle or Kelly's been a little bit better all around. You can make arguments for those different things. Costanzo based on position. Kelly based on just minimal mistakes. But Quinn Nelson is the missing piece. He was added to this offensive line, and he changed the culture of the offensive line. He changed the attitude, the swagger. It's Quinn Nelson who's plugged in this year and changed the overall culture of the Colts offensive line and gave them that mean streak, gave them that brotherhood. So when you look at this team outside of Luck and then you could say kind of outside of T.Y., top four players on this team, two of them are rookies. Yeah, I would agree. I think Quentin Nelson's been the guy that's kind of brought that offensive line together. Like you said, I think, I think Ryan Kelly's probably been the best player on the offensive line. I think he's been outstanding this year. I think he's an all-pro. I think he should be an all-pro. He's been that good. And yes, Costanzo plays left tackle, and he's been really good since he's come back. So those guys, everybody on the O line deserves some credit. But at the end of the day, the only the main difference is we've got 56 out there now, and he just really brings the entire offensive line together. And he's, I think he has helped. I think in Slauson as well. I think helped with this change the attitude of the offensive line. It's not like a milk toast group. These guys are aggressive. They want to bury your head in the dirt. They want to finish. They want to finish blocks. They don't stop blocking until the whistle blows. They play extremely hard. And I think Quentin Nelson deserves credit for that. But I also think Matt Slauson deserves some credit for that because he brought that in as well as a veteran guy. I think he's helped our offensive line a lot in the meeting rooms. And I don't think he's getting a lot of credit, but I think that he has helped. So I think you're seeing a guy on the field that brings it every game, like Quentin Nelson. And I think you see a guy off the field now who's obviously out for the year with an injury but I think that helped change the attitude of the guys in that offensive line room and Matt Slauson. So I wanted to give him a little bit of a credit shout out to him because, you know, obviously he's not on the field anymore, but I do think he helped change the culture of that offensive line. Yeah, that's nice because I wasn't even thinking about Slauson and probably most podcasts and most shows aren't giving Slauson any credit, but you're right because he came in as a veteran and that's kind of what you expect from a veteran. The crazy thing about Quentin Nelson, I mean, there was a lot of hype around him. We took him six overall. Normally guards don't go that high, but He's almost come in and brought a veteran presence to the field. I'm sure in the film breakdowns and all that stuff, off the field, I'm sure Slauson brings it there too, maybe where Quentin Nelson can't. But it's almost like he brings a veteran presence to the field, which, and the same thing, you could say the same thing about Leonard in a sense, where it's very rare to have two rookies so all around with it on the same team at the same time. Like, it's crazy. And the way I kind of view Quinn Nelson, it's a weird comparison, but I kind of would make the comparison because if you want to say Kelly's better all around or Costanza's more valuable or whatever, it's kind of like the Colts' defense when Sanders came back. Like, you want to say Freeney was the best player on that defense. You could totally make that argument. But the heartbeat was Sanders. Like, right now, defensively, the best player and the heartbeat is the same guy. It's Darius Leonard. On the offensive line... Quinn Nelson is the heartbeat. I think if Quinn Nelson were to go down, we would just lose so much just in terms of, like, attitude. Yeah, the thing I've noticed about Leonard and Nelson that I really, really like, and this is going to show my age, but I've been watching the NFL since probably, like, 1982 or 83, something like that. And the thing that really stands out about these two guys is their football maturity, meaning the way they play the game. They play the game like the guys played it back in the day, like – it's all about, and I hate using this word, man. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, but it, it's true. They're gritty, grimy guys. They play extremely hard. They play through the whistle. They make very minimal mistakes. You don't see them get stupid personal fouls. They're young players, and generally young players do that kind of stuff. They get emotional. They make really bad decisions, get dumb penalties, and you really haven't seen that out of Leonard at all, and very rarely out of Nelson what you've seen is both guys really get after it from the start of the play until and they play through the whistle both of them do there's a lot to be said for that that's how the game used to be played I mean it was very aggressive and you know you just play hard and and they've got that attitude and they're kind of like 
it's almost like watching two veteran guys out there, like you said. Like mm-hmm. Nelson gives you that vibe, and Leonard to me. I'm trying to think and just going through my head. I'm, like I said, I'm old, but I'm going through my head here, and I'm trying to think if he's made any really like stupid mistakes, meaning like dumb interference plays or emotional penalties, personal fouls after the play hitting a guy. I can't think of anything. And that, to me, is a sign of a mature football player that he plays with his head and not his emotion. You know what I'm saying? Like He doesn't mm-hmm. get emotional when guys talk to him or, or whatever – he doesn't get wrapped up in all that. He's about playing the game and playing it the right way, and I respect that about both of those guys. They play extremely hard. Nothing dirty about it. They just play hard through the whistle, and I have a lot of respect for that. And, man, I cannot wait to see what these guys look like in, like, three or four years. It's good. I mean, especially Darius Leonard, because I feel like I feel like Nelson's more of a finished product yeah. in the sense that, I mean, he played at a big school. He was well-known in college. Everyone knew he was going to be a monster in the NFL. Every, I mean, everyone knew. Pretty much everyone that I ever saw rate him said he was one of the best offensive linemen that's come out in the last 10 years. Darius Leonard, on the other hand, played at you know, a small school and wasn't as well known. And I actually thought we took him too high. I shouldn't bring that up because it makes me look like an idiot. But I, I'll admit when I'm wrong. I was 100% wrong on him. If there, there was 200%, I would say that. This guy... I mean, he's unbelievable for a kid that played at a small school to come in and make this impact. And I honestly think he is an all-pro. He's been that good to me. He's been unbelievable. The heart and soul of our defense. And, my God, I mean, he's just you watch this kid play, and it's so hard to believe that he's a rookie because he just doesn't play like one. Yeah, I love the point you made about how hard these two guys play. And that's really a theme with both of them. And it's something I teach my kids when I coach. If I coach anywhere from third to eighth grade, and you get the talented kid, you get the most talented kid in the grade, and they're always the laziest. They don't want to work hard. They kind of jog up and down the court. And I'm always telling them, or if I'm coaching baseball, you know, they, they jog it out the first base on a ground ball, the third or whatever. I always tell them, you're the most talented kid out there. If you worked as hard as the least talented kid out here, you'd be so by far the best player. And me and Jason are both Oriole fans, for those of you guys who know that. And one thing that I always had a problem with Manny Machado, he's the most talented player, one of the most talented players in the league. I mean, you put him in a class with maybe Bryce Harper, Trout, one or two other guys, he's in that class, jogs it out to first. And I'm like, why? You have world-class talent. If you could parlay the world-class talent with world-class effort and world-class heart, like some of the more less talented players that make it to the pros, purely based off just like work ethic and just busting their ass every day. That's what we have right now in Indianapolis. Maybe Darius Leonard wasn't the high recruit. He didn't get the scholarship to Clemson he wanted. A lot of people didn't have him in their top 150, but Ballard took him at 36. But obviously physically he has world-class physical traits, and that's why he was probably drafted 36 overall. And on top of it, he works his ass off. He plays. He's a smart player. He hustles. He plays after the whistle. Same thing with Quinn Nelson. Quinn Nelson has every single physical trait you would look for in a guard. And on top of it, he plays after the whistle. He pl- I mean, we talk about that play. We talked about it earlier in the show on Lux 3rd and 9 to Rodgers when it looked like he was going to go down and he kept his balance. Quinn Nelson held that block. And Quinn Nelson was going to hold that block until the whistle blew 15 times and he knew to let the guy go. But Quinn Nelson wasn't going to give up on the play. Even if everything around him collapsed, he was thinking, all right, if there's a 1% chance luck comes out of that, I'm going to hold my block so we have a chance to throw this ball downfield or luck could scramble and pick up the first down because the game was on the line. And he doesn't just think it with the game on the line. He plays that way every single down. From the first down of the game, the first play, first snap, to the final play of the game, that's how Quinn Nelson plays. And to have two rookies of that same kind of mold, and we go back to what we said in April when we were talking about the draft. Chris Ballard drafts captains. When you look at the last 2018 draft class, a lot of captains, if not all captains, a lot of guys who were leaders on their college team, doesn't matter if they were FBS, FCS, whatever, they were captains at the college level. And then they came here, and it's not just Leonard, it's not just Nelson. Of course, you're going to have a couple dumb penalties, stupid plays, but there haven't been any, like, catastrophic, just like, how could you be so stupid penalties 
on this Colts team this year in comparison to the Pagano teams <laughs> and the Grigson teams oh, where you had Josh McNary who literally concussed Vontae Davis in the end zone because he was trying to get back at Walker because Walker made him look foolish early in the drive. Then he beats him for a touchdown and he comes in five seconds late and he literally gave Vontae Davis a concussion. And you could talk about TJ Green in the late hits. TJ Green no, cost us the no, Jags no. game. He cost us the <laughs> Jags game. He cost us the Jags oh. game in London with boneheaded penalties and you could go down the list and it's not just rookies and it was not just guys who came to Indianapolis as draft picks and undrafted free agents we're also talking about veterans veterans who came from other teams and it was just the culture that was in Indy at the time with Gargano riding the ship and now you look at this team with Frank Reich and Chris Ballard and the players they're bringing to Indy captains at the collegiate level and you look at Darius Leonard and Quentin Nelson and this is year one this is year one of Frank Reich. This is year two of Chris Ballard. Darius Leonard's going to be the captain of this defense for a very long time. Quinn Nelson's going to be the anchor of this offensive line for a very long time. And this is just the ground state. These guys came in as rookies this year and are changing the culture. Could you imagine in two, three, four years down the road when other guys come in and follow their lead because they've been here for four or five years? It's crazy. Just It gets you so excited to think about the future of this team and we're still in the present we're on a five game winning streak we're making a push for the playoffs but then you start to think about the future you're like wow these rookies these early guys in their early 20s 22 23 years old came in here and they've made this type of impact and veterans are following their lead yeah and the thing I wanted to point out and the thing I look at just as somebody that uh, coach kids and I like learning from coaches and learning different ways to kind of get the best out of players the thing I like about this team and I've noticed is that even their best players have nonstop motors. They play as hard as they can for 60 minutes or in one game, 70 minutes. We played, you know, the overtime game with Houston, obviously. The thing I notice about this team is they just play hard all the time. And you don't always get that with young players. They have to learn sometimes you got to play hard the entire game. It's You can't ever lollygag in a football game because if you do, you could get hit. You could give up a big play. You think the ball's not coming your way, and then the ball is thrown over your head. So there's something to be said for the motor that all these guys have. And it's not just the rookies. It's everybody. There's not really anyone on this team or an example of a play that I can think of where a guy didn't give 100%. Now, I'm sure there are plays because the Colts have a thing called loafs that they go over in film study where there's somebody that's not running hard to the ball. But I don't, you know, I haven't watched that, so I can't speak on that. But what I, ha- what I do notice is that the best players, like Luke was saying, Manny Machado is a great example. He was the best player in the Orioles for years. And he was a too cool for school guy. He didn't run out ground balls. He had a lot of issues with other players. There's a lot of problems with him. Now, he's a great, great player. There's no argument here. Loved him as a player, but there was a lot of other garbage with him that I didn't particularly care for. I'm a guy, one of my building blocks as a coach is the thing that you can control is your effort. There's no excuse for you not to give 100% of your effort all the time when you're out on the field, no matter if you're the best player or the worst player. And like Luke said, generally speaking, the best players are the ones that try to just take it easy because they're so much better than everyone that they can get by with just their talent. But the truly best players are the ones that combine the effort with their talent. That's what makes a great player. That's the thing that stands out to me about this team as a whole is they all have nonstop motors. They don't take plays off. No matter what the circumstances, whether they're down by 20 like in a New England game or they're, they're ahead by 20 in the Buffalo game, they play hard. And that's what I always tell fans. Though. People ask me, why should I go spend money on this team? What do you want to see? You want to see a team that gives their effort, 100% effort all the time, no matter the score. They play hard for 60 minutes or however long the game is, and you see that with these guys. And I respect that about this team. Whether we make the playoffs or not, I'm going to remember this season as a positive experience because of the way these guys play, the effort, the way they're coached. You can see them learning. You can see the ascension of the team. Where in the past, like Luke said, I'm not going to go through all of the stuff that went on because I don't want you know everybody to have flashbacks and have to take medication. But <laughs> we had a lot of issues. I mean, from all the crap that we did in game to when we got behind, the effort went down the toilet. I mean, that was a problem throughout the entire Pagano 
tenure, not just last year, but you think about games, and even in the years we went to the playoffs, we had the Rams game at home. Mm-hmm. We just quit in that game. We had the Cardinals Cardinal game, game on the road, quit in that game. All the Patriot, I mean, Christ, all the Patriot games pretty much, we laid down, we fell behind. I mean, so you ain't ever going to see that with a Frank Wright coach team. This team's going to play hard. They're going to give you everything they got. So win or lose, of course we want to win every game, but win or lose, I can live with whatever because they're giving it everything they have. And at the end of the day, that's all you can ask. And that's what these guys are giving us. That's why I'm really enjoying this season. I'm so excited for the future. I mean, there's so much positivity going on. You know, it's just unbelievable. And it's such a change, a complete 180 from where we were last year. Yeah, and one thing I want to say about Grigson guys, the Grigson guys that are here right now, they're all hard workers. Like T.Y., he gives it 100%. Doyle, he gives it 100%. Unfortunately, now he's out for the season with the kidney, which we'll talk about. Gethers gives it 100% when he's out there, and a lot of times he's not out there because of injury. But when he comes back from injury, he's never hesitant. He always gives it 100%. So those uh, Luck I don't even consider a Grixon guy. I consider Luck a Colt guy, an Ursay guy, an obvious guy, because you'd have to be a moron Skip Bayless to not draft Andrew Luck first overall in 2012. So I don't give Grixon any credit for him. He got lucky that he got the job, and Luck was the first guy on the board when he got the job in Indianapolis. But when I look at Grigson guys, I think T.Y. Hilton, who was one of his best, if not his best pick, I think Clayton Gathers, and then I think undrafted free agent Jack Doyle. Also, none of them first-round picks. A lot of times first-round picks take it a little bit easier because they were kind of pampered in college and they went to a big school. Like You look at Darius Leonard's second-round pick, didn't go to a big school, had that chip on his shoulder. Quinn Nelson, yep. as highly rated of a guard as you could possibly be. I mean, you're talking about a generational talent. For a guy like that to be as hungry as he is every down is crazy. It's like that guy just wants to be great. For Tom Brady and Bill Belichick to still have the fire, for Coach K at Duke to still have the fire, for Greg Popovich to still have the fire, for LeBron James to still have the fire, it's not easy to maintain that when you hit a certain level of greatness, when you've been great for 10, 15, 20 years, and you're still hungry, when you win your fifth Super Bowl and you talk about the day after the Super Bowl, you talk about we're five weeks behind draft prep, behind everybody else, you're just obsessed with football. You're obsessed with winning. You're obsessed with being great. And I think we're starting to build that in Indianapolis. I mean, even these post-game locker room speeches, they're different. They're not satisfied. Yeah, it's five straight, but it's five straight of one season – We're not even in a playoff spot. If the season were to end today, we lose the tiebreaker. We're not first place in the division. We're still two games behind the Texans. We want to be great. We want to be a Super Bowl champion. And for the guys here, like for the rookies to be as hungry as they are, especially a guy like Quentin Nelson, like he is the offensive guard equivalent to Manny Machado. Manny Machado has every physical attribute you would want. He's as talented as you could be at the third base shortstop positions. Quinn Nelson is as prototypically built and as perfect as you could possibly build. If you were to build the ultimate left guard, you would build Quinn Nelson. And he's still so hungry. Goes to Notre Dame, sixth overall pick. He's hungry on every single down. And those are the type of players I love the most. Because then you have your guys who only make it to the league because they work harder than everybody else. But then you got the guys who are naturally talented, physically gifted, and work harder than everybody else or work as hard as the hardest working guy out there. And we got a couple of those in this draft. And that's what we're building this team around. And we have a top three quarterback in the National Football League to go along with it. We have a general manager who we're buying into. We have a head coach who we're buying into. The post-game, pre-game, recaps, whatever, in the locker room, the speeches, they're different. These guys are hungry. Four in a row, and eh, whatever. Five in a row, and eh, whatever. They're happy, but it's different. They're still going to come out the next week, and they're looking to go 1-0 against the Jags. Did we already beat the Jags? Yes. But guess what? It doesn't matter. Are we on a five-game winning yep. streak? Yes. Yes. But it doesn't matter because when we play the Jags this weekend, the game starts 0-0. We're going to play for 60 minutes, and we're either going to go 1-0, 0-1, or 0-0-1 in this game. And we need this game, and we're going to go out there, and we're going to play that one game. And I like that mentality. I like that the whole team has bought into that mentality, go 1-0 each and every week. 
And that's like a big thing right now. Like, did you guys see this five game winning streak coming? Well, it doesn't matter. Did we see five individual one game winning streaks coming? And yeah, if you go back, did I see us beating the Bills individually? Yes. Did I see us beating the Raiders individually? Yes. Did I see us beating the Dolphins this weekend individually? Yes. Did I see us beating the Jaguars individually? Yes. Did I see us beating the Titans individually? Yes. Like each individual game, I saw us winning going in. You can't just win five straight like in one shot. It doesn't work like that. You have to go into each game and win each game individually, and the Colts have done that now five games in a row, and we're going to continue to look at each game like it's a one-game playoff. Let's play the Jags this weekend. I don't care if Fournette's not playing. I don't care if Bortles got benched. I don't care if their OC got fired. We're going to go into this game like our season's on the line because it is, and we're going to play this one game like it's a playoff game, just like we've played every game the last five weeks, and the team has bought into that mentality. They're all working hard, and I'm not just talking about Ballard guys because it's not all Ballard guys. Like I said, there's still Grigson guys here, but the Grigson guys oh. that are still here are hard workers. You're talking about T.Y. Hillen. You're talking about Clayton Gathers. You're talking about Jack Doyle, even though Jack Doyle, again, unfortunately out for the season with the kidney. Yeah, and I was just going to say, the thing I like about this staff and front office is you can tell they're chasing greatness. They're not chasing – a wild card spot they're chasing super bowls and so when they win a game a big game yeah they're happy but their focus automatically shifts to the next game and go on one and oh and that's the key with this team and i love that about our staff i love that about our front office is they got the right guys they got guys in here with the right mentality that know how to win that know what it takes to win but at the same time aren't satisfied when they win They want more. They want more. They want more. They want to keep winning. They want to do whatever they have to do to keep winning, to get to the point where, okay, we're a dominant team. We go out on the field and we dominate every week. Now, we're not there yet. We're probably not close to that yet. But you can see it coming, and I say this every week. You can see what they're trying to get to. You can see them chasing greatness. You can see what Reich is trying to establish with the way the Colts play, the way they try to run the ball, the way they play whistle to whistle, the way this team is coached. You can see all this stuff. And if people think, if there's anyone out there that actually thinks you can compare this team to any of Pagano's teams in terms of technique and the way they play the game, the intelligence of the players and the way they play the game, the way, obviously, that the coaching staff has coached up these players to be in the right position, to be in a position to make plays, do they always make them? No. But if they're in the right position and they're in the right place, you can learn. You can learn to make the physical play. That stuff is all things you can learn. So the thing I'm most excited about is how fast this team has bought into what Frank Reich and his coaching staff has really kind of sold them in terms of a way to look at the game, a way to look at the week-by-week grind of an NFL season. It's not – a lot of coaches do it in, in, you know, uh, quarters, like four-week four-week little terms or whatever. Wright doesn't do it that way. He looks at it as 16 individual games, 1-0, and and 1-0. And that's what you want to do. You want all the focus not to be on anything other than the next game. That's the way Belichick is. That's why he always says, on to whoever, on to Cincinnati, on to – because what we just did, that's great. That's nice. Let's, let's celebrate it tonight. But we're on to the next thing in front of us. For us this week, that's Jacksonville. I love the attitude of this team. I love where we're going. I love the coaching staff. And people can say I'm a cheerleader or whatever. If you think I'm too positive, go back and listen to my shows last year, our shows last year. Even the Jet game. Go back to the Jet game from a month ago. After the Jet yeah, game, we were hard on this team. We were sitting at 1-5, and five and we were not happy. I'm, I'm always going to call everything like I see it. You know, Luke is the same way. We call it as we see it. Our opinions are based in fact. And we've won, yes, we've won five games in a row. In the one we just won, we played a terrible game for three quarters, in my opinion. But we found a way to win. Good teams find a way to win. Now we put that behind us. That has nothing to do. That game we just won and the other four before that have absolutely nothing to do with what's in front of us now. And that's what I love about this team and what I love about this coach. We've moved on from that. Now we're on to Jacksonville. We have to get focused. No matter how great we played last week or how bad we played, it doesn't matter. We have to win this week. We have to put our best foot forward this week so on and so forth till the season is over, and then we'll see where we're at. But as far as this team goes, it's 1-0 and every week, and this week we're looking at a Jacksonville team that's down, and we've got to step on their necks and really get this win, and that's all this team is focused on, and I can't wait 
to see how they play Sunday because they did not play great this past Sunday. So I fully expect that they're going to come back this week and put on a much, much better performance. I agree. And when you look at the last time the Colts kind of played a team in this position, not as bad in terms of just like the team kind of losing their mind mentally because this team I think is mentally fried right now. But the last time we saw a team where their starting quarterback, in this case he was injured, this week obviously with Bortles he's benched, was the Bills game. We went into that Bills game. We needed a win. We needed a win every week the last five weeks. And going forward, we pretty much need a win every week moving forward. But when you think about that Bills game, they came in. They were banged up. The running back went down. McCoy went down on the second play of the game. Allen missed the game. And we saw a team that was vulnerable. And we said, let's go for the jugular and let's beat this team by 30 points. And I see a very similar game this weekend. We're playing a team that... Only has three wins. They're on this massive losing streak. Their offensive coordinator just got fired. Their quarterback got benched, who plays very well against us for some godforsaken reason. Their running back got suspended. This Jags team right now is in shambles. And we need to go in there. And they don't have home field advantage because there's about 10 Jaguar fans in the world. And I think four of them (laughs) live in London. So there's no such thing as home field advantage. This is our second home game against the Jags this year. And we're going to go down to Jacksonville. And we're going, like, we should go down there and beat their brains in exactly what we did to the other teams that were down. Like, when we played against the Bills and they were down, we beat the crap out of them. The Titans weren't down, but they came into the game, and for some reason, they weren't with it. They weren't ready to play. And we said, all right, we'll take a 30-point win, and we'll have luck sit the last 10 minutes of the game. And that was a Titans team that was coming off a big win against the Patriots. But again, you want to go back to the 1-0, 1-0, 1-0 thing. Vrabel's obviously not coaching that up in Tennessee because that's what you call a letdown game. A lot of teams have that. You know who doesn't have letdown games? The Patriots. Do they play well every single game? No. They have obviously, they're humans. They've had games where they didn't show up and they didn't play well. But you don't call it a letdown game. Alabama doesn't have letdown games. Like the great teams with the great coaches, they don't have letdown games. They don't always play well every single game because it's not possible. But a letdown game is we are so high off last week's high that we are going to come crashing back to earth and back to reality the next week because we're still thinking about last week. We're still thinking about beating the Patriots. We're still thinking about that two-game winning streak against the Cowboys and the Patriots, and now we're going to go to Indianapolis, but we're still not not even thinking about the Colts because we're still thinking about last Sunday when we beat the Patriots. Remember how great that was? Remember how great that was? Remember how great that was? And then, boom, you get hit by a friggin' bulldozer with Andrew Luck coming in and putting up 38 points in a heartbeat and taking the last 11 minutes of the game off. So that's a letdown game. Teams that are coached to look at each game as an individual playoff game and, you know, forget the past and move on and just keep moving on and keep moving on and keep looking forward, those teams don't have letdown games. Are they going to play well every week? No. We just saw that last week. We didn't play well against Miami. But it wasn't. if we lost, I wouldn't have called it a letdown game because it wouldn't have been like we were still so excited about that Titans game that we lost the Dolphins game because we went into that Dolphin game knowing we needed that win. And the Titans should have came into Indianapolis knowing they needed a win. But they were still so preoccupied with beating the Patriots that they had a letdown game. The Patriots, Alabama, they don't have letdown games because they've been there. They've done that so many times. It doesn't matter to them. They're on to the next one, on to the next one, on to the next one. They don't have letdown games. We saw the Titans last week have a letdown game in Indianapolis. And right now we're building a culture. We're not going to play well every week, but we're building a culture that is not going, they're going to be immune to letdown games, in my opinion. It doesn't mean you're going to play well every week. You're going to lose games. You're, going to, you know, you're, going to, you're not going to go 16-0 and every season. But we're building a culture where we're going to forget about that. It doesn't matter how great last week's win was, we're going to move on from it. And that's what the Patriots do, and they've done for 20 years now. Before we wrap up the show, Luke, we want to send our best here for the culture to Jack Doyle, who had a pretty serious injury in the game, an internal injury with his kidney in the game Sunday against Miami was taken to a local hospital after the game had a procedure done. Obviously everybody's already heard the news that he's out for the season. We want Jack to get well soon. He's a prototypical Colt. We love him here. Everything that's right about this organization. Hopefully he will get well soon, you know, and play again. But for me, the most important thing is just get healthy, man. We want you to get healthy and be able to, to be able to just live your life. So it was a very serious injury from what I heard and good that it got taken care of. And the prognosis, according to Coach Reich, is good. We here at For the Culture just want to send our best to Jack Doyle, his family. We know that's a tough situation. Obviously, we've, we've gone through similar things in the past with Andrew Luck and obviously his lacerated kidney. It's not an easy thing to deal with. So I just wanted to kind of take a moment 
you know, send our best wishes to him because obviously the news has broke recently that he's out for the season and uh, he's going to be a big loss, big loss because he was a big part of what we did. But our best all around tight end, in my opinion, is uh, blocking second to none as far as tight ends go. So get well soon, Jack Doyle, and hopefully uh, we'll see you back on the field next year. No, yeah, 100%. I didn't realize it was that serious, but, you know, the kidney, internal organs, like, you don't want to mess with that stuff. We suffered the same thing with Andrews lacerated. Maybe not exactly the same. I don't know if they did the same thing to the kidney, but, again, very serious, and it's going to sideline him for the rest of the year, the remaining five games. Somebody tweeted that the Colts are 5-1 and one this year with Jack Doyle, and they're 1-4 without him. And I wouldn't put too much stock into that. I think that's just a little bit of like stat manipulation there. Jack Doyle is a very good player. He's one of my favorite players. Back in 2014, I was banging the table saying, sign Jack Doyle and get rid of, because everybody was like, who do we sign? Who do we sign? Do we sign Fleener? Do we sign Allen? Who do we give the big money to? Is it both? Is it one of them? And I was like, neither. Give me Jack Doyle. I love Jack Doyle. Undrafted free agent. I love the story. I love everything about him. Great blocking tight end. Great all-around tight end. Ebron's got 11 touchdowns in 11 games plus a rushing touchdown. But Jack Doyle is the all-around kind of Swiss Army knife tight end. He could do it in pass protection. He could do it in run blocking. He could do it in the receiving game. He kind of gives you a little bit of everything. So Jack Doyle is one of my favorite players on this team. He's one of the best players on this team. But it's not an injury that is going to prevent the Colts from going anywhere and being able to make a push for the playoffs. The five and one and one and four thing, it's coincidental. I mean, he's a he's a game changer. Like he's a big time player on this team, but I don't think he's the difference between five and one and one and four. I think that Costanzo and T. Y. and Leonard and a lot of other big time players and Marlon Mack overlapped games out and games on with Jack Doyle, resulting in the five and one, one and four game split with and without Doyle because we had a lot of guys injured at the same time as Doyle. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It's not a knock on Doyle whatsoever. No, It's just when Andrew Luck misses six games and you go one and five, and when he plays in six games and you go five and one, it's because he's so incredibly valuable at that position because he's an elite quarterback, so on and so forth. Jack Doyle is a very good tight end. He's one of the top 10 players on this team. He was a pro bowler last year. I love Jack Doyle. I mean, I went to bat for signing Jack Doyle over two guys we drafted in 2014. So I love Jack Doyle, but whoever was tweeting that out, whether it was Kiefer or whoever, one of those guys, it was, you know, it's stat manipulation. It's just coincidental that he happened to be on the field. Like, he was a game changer, I thought, in the Raider game. I don't think we'd win the Raider game without him. But he also had a big fumble in the Bengal game. In the one loss he played in, he had a big fumble at the end of that game. So Jack Doyle was a great player, serious injury. You know, the person comes before football, so you hope he's okay yeah. and you hope he's able to live his life normally. Uh, like all these guys, I mean, these such a physical, brutal, gruesome game. So you hope he could bounce back from this and play again next year in 2019. But I'm definitely a big Jack Doyle fan. Hate to see him go down. But if there was a year for him to go down, it's probably the year Eric Ebron has 11 receiving touchdowns in 11 games because at least we have – I mean, right now we're pretty decimated. It was our deepest position at one point in time. We have Ebron, who's yep. having an all-pro season. We have Doyle, who was a pro bowler last year. Mo Ali cox Swope, Hewitt. But now Hewitt's down. Swope's down, Mo Ali Cox is down, even though he might be back this week. And now Jack Doyle is done for the year. So Ebron's the only guy left in the tight end room that had too many names at one point. Now we're down to one guy, Eric Ebron. He's having an all-pro season statistically, even though he's a little bit more one-dimensional than Jack Doyle. He's having a great, great season in the receiving game and even has a rushing touchdown on top. What about Ebron, Jason? 56 games in Detroit, 11 receiving touchdowns. 11 games in Indianapolis, 11 receiving touchdowns. But Matt Stafford is a better quarterback than Andrew Luck. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I, I, look, this is what I saw. Have. I, I didn't see the amount of touchdowns that he's had. That's incredible. But I did see him having a breakout year with the Colts, and the reason why is simple. It's Frank Reich. He knows how to utilize tight ends. Then you've got a guy like Andrew Luck who pretty much has had really – taken advantage of all the tight ends he's had in his career, whether that be Dwayne Allen early, Kobe Fleener early, Jack Doyle. Now he's got Ebron, who's a more athletic version, I think, of all of those guys. So I saw this coming as far as I thought he would be very, very good. I predicted he would make the Pro Bowl, but I did not – the sheer amount of touchdowns is mind-boggling to me because I, I just – I did not see that amount. But I just think Frank Reich knows how to use – 
skill players, man. He just knows how to utilize guys, and and he's been a big time addition to this team. My biggest concern with this Doyle injury is the fact that we have nobody else right now that's a hundred percent healthy, other than Ebron. Honestly, I really it's going to be sound crazy, but I really the guy kind of hope gets help. I mean, I want them all to get healthy, but the guy I think we need the most Hewitt. out of the three guys, and this is going to surprise everybody, <laughs> is Hewitt. Hewitt. Because yeah. Hewitt is the blocking guy, and the other two guys are raw. Like, Mo Ali Cox, I think, actually is a little better than Swope, which is Definitely insane, more upside. But, he might not be as polished right now in the moment, but he definitely has more right. upside. Because he's doing things this year that Swope just Swope hasn't has. done, and Swope's been here for like five years. Like, the project's gone on too right. long. So, like, I like Swope. I like the idea and everything, but I think Mo Ali Cox is a more athletic, bigger hands, better athlete version of what we wanted Swope to be. And it's rare that you have two guys that are like the same type of project going on at the same time. But that's what we have. But I think right. the ceiling is higher for Mo Ali Cox, even if you want to say Swope is more polished right now. It would only make sense. Swope's been with the Colts for what, three, four, five years? Mo Ali Cox just yeah. got here, so Mo Ali Cox has less football experience, and he made that catch. What what was that catch in the Raider game? The one handed catch. Yeah, one, I don't. Yeah, it was in the Raider. Yeah, I don't think Swope yeah. has the ability to do that right now, oh, no. and maybe ever no. because that was an elite one hand grab. I'm hoping that Ballard, if these guys aren't ready to play this week, and I'm sure he he's already doing this, but. I'm really hoping he's looking for a blocking tight end. Somebody's got to be out there that can come in and, and help this team that can block. Because Luke and I talked about this off air. I was thinking maybe Kobe Fleener, because Luck is familiar with him, but he's just not a good enough blocker, I don't think. Yeah, that's the so, problem. Because with Doyle, you're not losing just the receiver. You're losing the blocker. That's why you want Hewitt back, because Hewitt's going to come yeah. in. He's not going to catch passes. Yeah. But we already have Eric Ebron, who's on pace to catch 16 touchdowns this year which is you know one shy of Gronkowski's all-time yeah. tight end receiving record in a single season. So we don't really need the receiver in the tight end position. We need the blocker. Doyle's great because he gives you both, and that's why he's the most well-rounded tight end, even though Ebron's having the statistical all-pro season. Hewitt's nice because he gives you a blocker. If you get Kobe Fleener, he's just a worse version and a non-athletic version of Ebron. And then you just have two of like, yeah. you know, so he doesn't give you block it because he can't block. So who who would we trade away, Jason? Did we trade a tight end away? Darrell Daniels. Yeah, where did he uh, did he end up making the team? He got traded to, or did he get cut? I think he just got. It's funny you mentioned him because I think I, I saw Atlanta just signed him. Somebody oh. just signed him like yesterday. So <laughs> bad timing. Cause yeah, because that would have been, been a nice guy pickup. to bring back. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm yeah. sure those guys are easier to find. I'm sure that Ballard's on top of it right now. Maybe he already has a guy. So. We'll see what happens there. Yeah, by but, the, but, but by the time this comes out, we'll probably have signed somebody. Yeah, so. we'll probably have signed like three. Like Phil, uh, Philip Walker will have been released for the 15th time for this the season from the time. practice. <laughs> it's so – I feel bad for the – I don't even think he leaves the parking lot anymore. I think he just sits in his car. All right, Ballard, hey, I'm going to be in my car. Just give me a ring when you're ready. Honestly, I think they probably tell him, listen, it's just roster manipulation. We're going to bring you back. Just sit by your phone. Yeah, Honestly, yeah. he probably doesn't even do. clean out his locker. <laughs> if he cleans out his locker yeah. every time he gets released – his arms are going to fall from carrying the box back and forth to his car. He gets, he gets released right. like literally twice a week. He's been released so many yeah. times since the middle of the summer. People are going to laugh at this, but uh, I think they like him a lot because he's a very good scout team quarterback, and he gives the first-team defense a lot of good looks mm-hmm. as, far, as far as like what type of quarterback they're going to go against that week. He's athletic enough to move around like Mariota. He can stand in the pocket and make throws. So I, think, I do think that's why they like him. They see upside in him. And they and they also like what he gives the team as far as scout team looks. That stuff is important because that's during the week. That's what you're preparing. Like yeah, it's stuff you don't normally think about, prepared. but it is definitely important when it comes to yeah. you know a full team because they do little things behind the scenes that we're just not thinking about. And we don't. Well, I guess we just did think about it because you just brought it up. But normally people aren't talking about what scout team quarterbacks are doing for the starting defense and how they're mimicking Mariota and other quarterbacks and Deshaun Watson and other quarterbacks in the division. But Philip Walker, I think, does do a good job of that, and they obviously like him because every time he gets cut, he gets re-signed to the practice squad, so he keeps coming yep. back. And one last thing I want to touch on, 
the past Andrew Luck only because there was such hysteria over it. And then we kind of got different answers. Brissett said that he wasn't supposed to throw it. Reich said he wasn't supposed to throw it. He was supposed to run it. Reich said that wasn't the design, but it was an option. And then Luck said that, no, that was the way the play was supposed to be drawn up. I think Luck meant if I was open. Because like what ended up happening, I think, personally, is if you look at a freeze frame before the snap, like directly before the snap, Luck is wide open. It's a fourth down. Luck is wide open. And there's about 30 yards of just green. So if the right. ball is there immediately and Luck catches it, it's an automatic first down. You might even get 10 yards upfield. The problem is I think Brissett might have been a little bit rusty because he was sitting on the bench and then he has to catch a live snap and throw a ball in a game, and he probably wasn't prepared for it. Number two, you're throwing to a quarterback, so I don't think he wanted to put the type of zip he would put on it if he was throwing a bubble screen to T.Y. So if the ball was thrown lower, I think Luck catches it, falls for the first, and doesn't get hit. But the problem was he kind of floated it up there. Naturally, Luck's not just going to let a fourth down ball go over his head. Naturally, he's going to jump up. It's crazy that he actually like caught the ball at its peak, came down, took a lick, and held onto the ball. I don't know what quarterback holds onto that ball, but Andrew Luck does. If he's the only quarterback in the league, we witnessed it this week. Was I happy? No, I was pissed off. I was not. I was like, what is right thinking? Why would you put your quarterback in that position? He took a lick. He landed on his throwing shoulder. I was very upset in the moment, as I'm sure a lot of Colt fans were. After the game, we kind of got explanations, but the explanations isn't what did it for me. What did it for me and kind of brought me to peace with it was when I looked at the, like, if he doesn't get up and he re-aggravates the shoulder, like, I'm not probably talking like this right now because I'm just going to be so incredibly out of my mind angry. But when you look at the replay, there was so much real estate when Brissett threw that ball, it's kind of hard to get mad that it happened. It was just kind of like if the ball doesn't float to luck there and you just throw it on a zip and he could catch it, he's going to get out of bounds or get down, and there's going to be no hit. So that's kind of how I felt on that. If I talked about this, when it happened during the game, my answer would probably be a little bit different and I'd be a little bit more emotional. But now a couple days removed, that's how I feel about that. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan of the play, but let me tell you what I saw. Came the line of scrimmage, and Minka Fitzpatrick was on Andrew Luck. As soon as he saw Andrew Luck was split out, he basically started moving towards the box like he was going to blitz. And I think what happened was it was a design sneak with Brissett. He was going to run the ball. But when Fitzpatrick came in tight and he realized nobody was covering Luck, he made the decision, okay, I'm going to throw it to Luck because there's nobody out there. The problem was the throw was high, and he floated it enough that it gave the guys time enough to get out there and hit him. The play itself was a good design because there was really no one on Luck. The problem was the execution was not good. Mm-hmm. The throw was bad. I kind of wish they would have used the time out there because I don't like the idea of Luck catching passes in the sense that like that kind of crap's going to happen the ball's going to get thrown high he's going to have to go up and catch it and you know the way Andrew Luck is wired he's going to go up there and get the friggin' ball (laughs) guy comes over and drives his throwing shoulder into the turf I mean that's just that's like worst case scenario type crap we're very it was worst case scenario until the result worst case scenario is he doesn't get up but up until the actual landing, it was as bad as you could draw it up minus him dropping the ball. Because we ended up scoring a touchdown on that drive. It was a big drive, actually, keeping it alive there because that was a fourth down. But you don't want to put him in that position. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. No. The week before, we never talked about it, but Ebron had like an end around. It was, I think it was the, yeah. the Philly yeah. special or whatever they called it last year from the Super Bowl where they threw it to luck. And people also got upset about that. Same thing. I thought it was just bad execution. It was a bad throw. Luck naturally, like you said, he's just wired to go after the ball because that's just the way he is. So he's going to go after the ball. As most competitive athletes would, you see a ball dangling up there in the end zone, you're going to lay out for it. But it's just like when you watch the Philly special, it's been run a bunch of times in college this year. It's been run on two-point conversions. It's been run a few times since the Super Bowl. And including in the Super Bowl, every time it's ran, like literally every time I've seen it run, 
it's run where the quarterback is wide open. If it's unsuccessful, right. the quarterback is dropping a wide open ball. Never has the quarterback been. I, I think Andrew Luck was double teamed in the end zone. They were so ready yeah. for it that Luck had a guy on him, and then there was a guy behind him, and then Ebron threw up a. Ebron threw, shouldn't have thrown it, but you tell a tight end to throw the ball. What are they going to do? They're going to make the correct read. Like no, they're not going to make the correct read. They're going to just throw the ball in the air, and that's what he did. He just right. kind of lollipopped it up in the air, and Luck made an effort to get it. There was really no chance that he was going to get it, but he made an effort to get it. And then, of course, you're giving an opportunity for him to get hurt. It's just physics, and quarterbacks are wearing less pads than everybody else. So I'm not a fan. I'm just not a fan. Frank Reich has so many brilliant, beautiful design play calls that do not require Andrew Luck to turn into a wide receiver. I think that we saw the last one of the season, possibly... Andrew Luck and Frank Reich's careers, I don't think you're going to see them pull anything like that again. I think Reich's going to put the rest of the quarterback receiving option plays away, unless it's Brissett maybe as the receiver and Luck is not involved in the play or Luck's throwing to Brissett or something like that. I don't think Luck's going to be a receiver again ever in Indianapolis. I don't think we need to worry about it. Honestly, Luke, I wouldn't mind it if they ran that play again and just let him run the quarterback sneak. Well, that's different. I'm just saying I don't think we're going to see another target for Luck again, ever. Because the no, two no, targets no, for I, Luck I, both that, were that ugly. I agree with. That I agree. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to see it again. But the problem is, even in Andrew Luck's answer, Andrew Luck's answer was my favorite answer. Like, Reich's answer, I thought he kind of it was a little bit vague. I did not hear Brissett's answer. I heard Brissett's answer from somebody else who was talking about the play as you and I are right now and they were just saying what Brissett said, so I did not hear word for word what Brissett said. And then I heard Luck's post game, and Luck said, no, that's the play. Luck meant that's the play if my man leaves, Minka left, and blitzes. Luck literally looks at himself as just a football player. Whether it's me or T.Y. or Rodgers or Inman, if the receiver there's man blitzes, the receiver becomes the number one option, even if I'm the quarterback and I'm supposed to run it, or I'm supposed to hand it off to Mac. I'm audibling out of that, and I'm throwing it to that wide-open receiver, and that's what happened there. And then he talked about Brissett was just a little bit rusty. He was sitting for an hour, and he hadn't thrown, and it was just a high ball that I went up and got because I'm a football player. That's literally how Luck looks at it. We've been very fortunate this year that Frank Reich has kind of coached that out of Luck in terms of in the wide-open field. We've seen him step out of bounds at the two-yard line, not lower his shoulder, slide more than normal. So he's minimized hits. This was just such an unorthodox hit because it was a reception that it makes yeah. us talk about it. Like if Luck lowered his shoulder on the Kiko Alonso late hit and Luck lowered his shoulder and took a hit there, we probably wouldn't be talking about it because it would just be a football play by a quarterback break in the pocket, something Andrew Luck's done a billion times, even though we're not a huge fan of it, just slide, get down. But that was so unorthodox because it was a pass to a quarterback. It's different. It's like something we haven't seen before, so it's something we're going to talk about because it's just out of the ordinary. A quarterback scrambling, getting out of the pocket, and taking a hit is just football. But a quarterback splitting out wide and catching a ball at its peak and taking a lick from a D-back is not normal. So that's why we're talking about it. But it's not even a I think topic we'll, I, in any other way. I think we way. might see it again, Luke. I do think we might see it again, honestly. I think it'll be in like a Super Bowl-type situation. Well, if we're in a Super Bowl, I'm going to be happy about that. But personally, I don't want to <laughs> see Luck catch any more passes. But if we're in a Super Bowl, if you tell me the next time Andrew Luck catches a pass that's in a Super Bowl, I'll sign up for that reception. I would not be surprised if Andrew Luck first – and only career touchdown is a Super Bowl career is a Super Bowl <laughs> touchdown. I'm calling my shot. It's possible. It's possible. Let's get there. Let's get there. <laughs> we gotta get there first. Gotta though. get there first. Right. Gotta get there first. We're definitely building something special though. We're building something special. Let's go one and this week against the Jags and just keep this thing rolling, man. 